This podcast is a proud member of the Unidentified Network. On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. So, what have we got exciting that's coming up in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hennis, in this episode we go back to Loch Ness with the inscribs. And there's more stuff as well, but you're just going to have to wait and see. I really like the old credits. Good afternoon, ladies and gents, and welcome to another... Goodness me, what's happening over there? Hey, you're to recite a new poem at St. Waypunt School, and it goes like this, as as follows, what I am going to recount to you now. <coughs> a spangled pandemonium is missing from the zoo. He bent his bars with barest bit and slithered glibly through. He leapt across the moated wall and climbed the mango tree. The Luwinish keeper scurried up. He bit him in the knee. To all of you a warning not to wander after dark. Or if you do, take special care to steer clear of the park. For the spangled pandemonium He's missing from the zoo. He's already bit his keeper and he'll just as soon bite you. Thank you very much for that lovely surprise from the lovely Miss Helga Dibley. And I notice I said lovely twice in that sentence. But I don't care. Now, my name's John Downs. I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology. And welcome to another episode of On the Track. For those of you who don't know, On The Track is a web TV show we do every Saturday afternoon for about half an hour and every Wednesday evening for about half that, although those times are massively approximate. And it is a mixture, a melange, a medley. Uh, Lauren, what else begins with M? My clothes, of course. Yes, I can work with that. Thank you, Lauren. And it's a microbe of hard science, weird shit, and surreality. And if you don't know what surreality is, go and ask her. I don't know why you're asking me. I'm just a girl. I won't accept that level of sexism from anyone, even from Queen Mary I of England, better known as Bloody Mary, because of her brutal and relentless persecution of nonconformist religious people. Oh, go away! <laughs> And now we go to Loch Ness. No, it's not. Richard wants to talk about sharks. Recently, a short video surfaced online that shows what is transparently a great white shark of about 10 feet long swimming around a boat and it's being filmed on a phone. Uh, the clip is only 10 seconds long. It was said to be filmed off the coast of Galway in Ireland. 
but there were several red flags uh, with this piece of film. <coughs> Number one is the length of the film. It's only 10 seconds, which seems very short. Uh, number two, the press agency that it came from, no one had ever heard of. It seemed to have spring, sprung up out of nowhere. And number three, when the fishermen involved were contacted, they didn't answer any of the shark experts or newspaper agencies that contacted them. A few days later, it was shown to be a hoax when somebody found online the whole sequence of film and it was taken off the coast of southern Australia and it's uh, transparently in Australia when we see the whole of the film but it's not the first time a hoax like this has happened every so often every few years there's a piece of film or a photograph that's supposed to have been taken around Great Britain uh, purporting to show a great white shark and it ends up being from South Africa or Australia or the uh, west coast of America or somewhere like that. That being said, there have been some very convincing sightings of great whites in Britain. Uh, perhaps the most convincing was about 15 years ago and it was off the north coast of Scotland, I believe around the Shetland Islands. And there were a group of marine biologists who were diving and they saw an enormous fin and at first they thought it was a basking shark then they saw all the seals go lunging out of the water onto land and the fin turned and came towards them so they got back onto the boat and they all saw a 15 foot great white shark come right up close to the boat and it tipped up on its side to look at them which is um, classic great white behaviour and they said it was grey on top with a clear demarcation white underneath and it was just like great whites they've seen elsewhere in the world. Then there was um, more recently another case from Scotland where a great white was supposed to have been temporarily caught by fishermen who managed to take a couple of snaps of it but they weren't very good uh, uh, before it escaped back into the sea but everyone that's seen them said that yes that's a great white until they said it was off the coast of Scotland and they say oh oh, uh, uh, oh no 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 it couldn't have been. Uh, about 20 years ago uh, seals were turning up off the coast of northern Cornwall with great chunks bit now off them and people that saw them, experts that saw them said they looked just like great white bites and a number of people claim to have seen great whites off the coast of Loo uh, one of them was a fisherman who saw a great white lunge up out of the water and kill a seal and he went to the area with his boat and he saw there was a great lump of seal flesh in the water and he said if he'd have had a boat hook he would have tried to have pulled it in but he wasn't going to do it with his bare hands with a great white about and apparently that specimen uh, was resident off the loo for several months feeding off the seals but died when it got caught up in a fisherman's net and the fisherman cut it free but it was already dead but he didn't tell anybody because he thought he might get into trouble for having uh, accidentally killed the shark. Uh, there was another off the southern coast of England where fishermen actually had a great white 12 to 15 feet hauled out onto uh, the deck of their boat and it slithered off back into the water again. This was at night so there's been a number of sightings. So there have been a number of convincing sightings by marine biologists and fishermen off the coast of Great Britain, everywhere from Scotland to Cornwall. So it seems that great whites are occasional visitors to our shore and we should be surprised because we are well within the range of the great white globally. Temperature wise, the waters off Britain, even off Scotland in summer, are warm enough for great whites because great whites can tolerate quite cool water, They're more of a temperate water fish than a tropical water fish. Um, off the southern coast of Australia and southern um, uh, Africa, it's not as warm as it is in the more equatorial regions. So we're well within the range that they tolerate. Uh, Great Britain has the biggest population of grey seals anywhere in the world. 
so there's plenty of food for them. And as global warming takes a hold, we should be seeing more of them turning in our waters. Uh, one question, Richard. Are there any other sharks in British waters that are large enough to bite a seal in half? There are no other sharks in British waters that prey on seals. There is the poor beagle shark, which belongs to the same family as the great whites, the uh, Lamidae, and is superficially similar shape, but is a good deal smaller with a different shaped dorsal fin and larger eyes, and that feeds almost exclusively on fish. Then there's the short fin mako, which is quite a, a reasonably sized shark, not nearly as big as a great white, but again it feeds almost exclusively on fish. The only other shark that could do this would be the Greenland shark, or sleeper shark, that grows to 23 feet long. And they're a deep water fish, but they have been known to come up to the surface and kill seals. And um, they've even been recorded to attack um, swimming reindeer in a way that crocodiles attack wildebeest. But their teeth and jaws are very different from the great white, and they make weird corkscrew-like uh, indentations on their prey when they bite it. And now we go to Loch Ness with our old friend Ian Squibbs once again. So... There was a story somewhere along the line with this about mm -hmm. the Loch Ness Centre asking NASA to get involved. There is something coming up. NASA, um, NASA are going to um, team up, I believe, with some probably some kind of uh, equipment, sonar equipment or something. But we shall see. But yes, I didn't. I did notice that, but. Uh, I didn't read too much into it at the time, but we can cover that. Uh, we can cover that in coming episodes. Well, I've just got the greatest headline for that. If we do it, if we drum the rocket, we've got a problem. Yes, and we can think up other, um, other jokes connected to NASA stroke Loch Ness. Right. Oh, sure we can. Mm. Right then. So. Let's move on to the next item on the agenda. And we're going to start with a question. So, John, what is our favourite thing? Well, to be perfectly frank, there's only one answer. It's Frank Sell. <laughs> That's right, it's Frank Searle. And how is it not possible for us to appear on CFZ TV without mentioning Frank? So here we go. So today, we have got a piece of Frank Searle history to look at. It's good news, but it did make me a bit envious when I saw it. So, firstly, though, we'll need to make reference to a documentary that came out in 2005 and was shown on British TV's Channel 5, which uh, is almost 20 years ago. So, the documentary was called The Man Who Captured Nessie and was made by Scottish documentary maker uh, Andrew Tullis. The film follows the story of Frank Searle and his time at Loch Ness. It charts the rise of Frank as a monster hunter and his downfall with the debunking of his infamous monster photos and his numerous conflicts with other monster hunters. The ultimate aim of the programme was to try and track down Frank at that present moment. You have to remember that this was 2005 and Frank was still alive at the time. The film catches up with Loch Ness locals who knew Frank and they talk of their experiences with Frank and revisit some of the key locations of Frank's residence at Loch Ness. Uh, one such location was the site of Frank's original camp, where he lived in his tent on the southern shore near Dawes. When he first arrived at Loch Ness in 1969, it was also at this location 
that Frank himself built a small pier or jetty from iron rods and wood that would protrude out into the lock. And uh, it was here that Frank would spend many hours observing the waters with his camera at the ready. And we can see an image of Frank in action in his day with his handiwork. If we look at the next image there, we can see there's uh, two images there. So you've got um, this Frank being interviewed for the TV programme Nationwide in 1972. And if you just look behind Frank in that image, um, there's the pier that he built behind him all by himself. And the lower image, we have Frank there standing on his pier, cutting a lonely figure. So that's uh, that. So... As most of us know, Frank left Loch Ness in 1983 in a storm of controversy and bad feeling. And the documentary visits the site of the pier that Frank built. And we see what remained of the structure 22 years after his departure. So let's have a look at the next images. And they're from 2005 of what remained of Frank's pier. So we can see that there. So... Basically, that's what we have. There it is. Definitely remains of what was once Frank's pier, but the ravages of time, souvenir hunters, and general damage, probably caused by the monster, has reduced the structure to a mere skeleton, as we can see. So that's what we got. Now, we're not going to dwell on this documentary. All I will say about it is that it's a superb piece of journalism and anyone interested in Frank Searle or Loch Ness in general should check it out if you haven't done so already and it's quite easy to find on YouTube. So, so what we're going to do is see what remains of Frank's pier in the present day. We saw the, the sad-looking structure in the 2005 images and surely, 19 years later, there can't be anything remaining. Or can they? I'm sure quite a few of our viewers have seen the uh, Loch Ness Exploration Facebook page. If not, then check it out. It's full of up-to-the-minute news on the Loch Ness mystery and numerous contributions from group members. Anyway... On the 7th of June, a Facebook user by the name of Colin Cobb posted some photos on the Loch Ness exploration page. Colin had located the site of Frank's pier and was able to show us what little remains of the structure where Frank once stood on his quest for the monster. So, if we look at the next image, we can actually see um, a photo of what... Um, Colin took and what remains so let's have a look at that if we can do that there get that up so two iron rods breaking through the surface of the lock over 50 years later and the ghost of Frank is all but washed away that's all we've got And uh, he also took some more closer views of these iron rods. If we look at the next uh, image, that's, that's it. That's all we've got left. And so, yeah. But there is still something there, as we can see. And we can see, um, I've, I've actually done a side-by-side -side comparison of Frank on his pier and the site today. So if we look at the next, uh, the next image, we've got the two... Th the two there, there's Frank on his pier, and today the same site. And uh, the mountainous backgrounds do match up, so it's definitely the same location. So, yeah. Eventually, Frank abandoned living in his tent and moved into his now famous caravan. Uh, initially, the caravan was stationed on the shore near Dawes too. And Mr. Cobb was able to locate the original site of this too. So if we go to the next uh, 
the next image there, John, we've got, uh, you can see the comparison of the two sites. So we've got, we've got a photo of Frank casually leaning on a farm gate, camera at the ready with a huge grin on his face. And then in the background, you have his caravan and uh, followed by the waters of the lock. And the site is very different today. As we can see in the lower image, the wall and the gate is now gone. But a careful study of the mountains in the background can be used to match the images up. So, yeah, there we go. So, um, I actually managed to speak to Mr. Cobb on Facebook, and he said it was okay for me to use his photos. And he also gave me the location of his findings as uh, I aim to visit the site on my next trip to Loch Ness. Uh, he kindly provided me with a map uh, to guide me to the destination. And we can actually look at this map if you can just go to the next uh, image there. We got the map there. It is uh, so as we can see. Uh, we can see the uh, location marked in red on the south shore of the lock in the first map. And the second map is zoomed in on the area. The red circle is where Frank's pier once stood. And the yellow outline, as we can see, is actually where a herd of alpacas reside. And they have been known to swim in the lock. And um, if we look at the next picture, we can actually see an alpaca alongside Frank's pier. Let's just look at this image because I find this a very, very somewhat is somewhat ironic. The image seeing the remains of Frank's presence at the lock, and right next to it, you've got a long net creature. What are the chances of that happening? Right? So, there we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It looks like something Frank would um, create himself and sell to the press. Um, I asked Mr. Cobb if he was able to locate the area where Frank's tent wouldn't stood. And uh, he said he was unable to find this spot and it had probably become overgrown with trees and shrubbery. So I don't know when I will be back at Loch Ness, but when I do go back, my mission will be to find the location where Frank's tent once stood. In the 2005 documentary, they did pay a visit to the tent site, so I will try to use some indicators from that and try and pinpoint the spot. And we can see, if we just go to the next image, we can see Frank there stood in front of his tent, so it would be good to locate that and retrace the footsteps of Frank Searle. So yeah, there we go. Um, I did wonder, actually, if Mr. Cobb, whom I spoke to regarding this, is actually maybe a relative of British motor racing driver John Cobb, who um, tragically lost his life on Loch Ness in 1952 whilst trying to break the uh, water world speed record and has since become part of uh, Loch Ness folklore. But uh, I didn't ask him about this, so maybe it was just coincidence. We don't know. So... There we go. There we have it. Um, a roundup of the latest news from Loch Ness. And as usual, the story of Frank Searle refuses to go away. Once again, we were drawn in and we didn't want to leave. Though Frank is no longer with us, his unique style of monster hunting, his books and his photographs will ensure that a part of Frank will forever be with us and is still living in a caravan somewhere on the shores of Loch Ness. Some, Thank corner, you. some corner of the Scottish field. Just yes, with a girl Friday. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, Follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And there's the ghost of Joe Strummer, who's an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, says, Don't forget to ring the notification bell 
otherwise you miss the new episodes. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? These might look like ordinary, everyday people, but they're not. Let's take a closer look. I'm filling my tomato harness with talcum powder on the moon. <laughs> Back seats. The keeper will come in the hillside. Cherry ripe, cherry ripe. I live inside of a crab with Rip Van Winkle and the Patter Cake Man. Yes, they were all wazzocks. You can tell wazzocks by their general waz tardiness. So remember, think once, think twice, think wazzock. That was a public information film. But before we come to the end, there is a little bit more for you. You will remember the other day Richard Freeman conducted an experiment. Well, here is part two of his experiment. So, we are at the next stage of our scientific experiment to recreate the extinct cabana bar. If you remember before, we used the base of Bounty Bar with a Glacier Cherry. It wasn't quite right because we missed out an essential component. If you remember in the Jurassic Park books, then there was some genetic material missing from the dinosaur's genome and they had to replace it. Well, we were missing caramel. Cabana had caramel as well as coconut, chocolate and cherry in it. So we've got some caramel sauce and we're going to try again to recreate an approximation of the extinct cabana bar. There the caramel sauce goes onto the bounty and glaze her cherry. But it's much nearer, much closer to the cabana bar. The only real difference is the cherry and the caramel were inside the bar rather than separately but once you masticate it all together it's a very very similar taste. I declare this experiment to be a success. Caramel sauce, bounty, glacé cherries, you've got as near as damn it to the prehistoric cabana bar. <laughs> And here we are finally at the end, and I want to say a big thank you to my guests, Ian Squibbs and Richard Freeman, but for whom we would not have been able to have a show at all, and a big thank you to my producer, Louis, who is still gallivanting around the colonies dressed as Uncle Sam. And I really don't know what he's doing this week, and I'd very much rather not. But no doubt we shall find out in the fullness of time. And I want to say a big thank you to all the people who keep the home fires burning. The Deputy Director of the CFZ, Graham Inglis, who is also my carer, who means that he's the guy who takes me to the hospital, puts me to bed at night, makes sure I take my medicine on time and do all the other stuff that I have to do. And the Assistant Director of the CFZ, the ever lovely Gwyn Palmer, but for whom I really wouldn't be able to function. So thank you very much, darling, for everything you do. Now, I'm going to be back next week. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to be doing next Saturday, but I have a sneaking suspicion that we will be taking a visit to Daniel's big cryptid conference in somewhere in Somerset, to come, uh, Highbridge in Somerset, where I am going to be speaking and you will be showing, you will be all seeing my speech in its full and some other behind the scenes stuff about the conference and how it's going. So, are you going to be watching Mr. Corinan? 
because if you are going to be watching Mr. McCrimmon, I'm going to be there doing the live chats and all the other stuff that I do. And assuming that you're there watching Mr. McCrimmon, I'm going to be seeing you.